from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 64, recorded on the 5th of May, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column over on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. And you know, I don't know how many more years we are going to have a lot of important health topics to talk about. One hopes it's no more than two years, but we'll see. Today, we're going to talk about Paul's latest column entitled Anti-Vaxxers, The Dog That Caught the Car. And you write that uh, anti-vaccine activists have been around uh, since the 1800s. In fact, there's a a, a painting which uh, you, you, you've seen coming up around in Jenner's day of people getting his uh, smallpox inoculation and growing cow parts from the inoculated area. And it's distributed by the Anti-Vaccine Society. So already back then, which was Seven, late 1700s, I think that was. Right. I think the painting was 1804. It was by James Gilray. And, and you, you see in the middle is, is Edward Jenner, a disinterested Edward Jenner, sort of looking askance, while people around him who he's recently inoculated are developing bovine characteristics, you know, <laughs> snouts, floppy ears, tails, and everybody's frightened by all this. And it's, it was a powerful picture. Amazing. But you say today these anti-vaccine organizations are uh, well organized and well funded, so that begs the question: Where do they get their money from? By interested donors, who who many of whom are wealthy, who believe that the, that Informed Consent Action Network or Children's Health Defense are representing their point of view, which is that vaccines are unnecessarily da- dangerous and should be eliminated. Yeah, there's always going to be those those kinds of individuals. All right, uh, now back to the car and the dog. Uh, you write that probably 3,000 people are infected with measles in the U.S. Uh, How do we know this? Well, we don't. We're guessing. I mean, the CDC, due to sort of cutbacks in funding and personnel, cutbacks in funding for surveillance, are basically guessing. So if you look on the CDC's website, you'll see there's between 900 and 1,000 confirmed cases, often confirmed by PCR, confirmed by serology. But but a lot of people don't necessarily see their doctor when they have measles, especially in these sequestered communities like the Mennonite community in West Texas. So you're guessing. But when I've talked to people on the ground, like Catherine Wells in in, uh, Texas, or others at the CDC, the sense is that this is much worse, and it could be at least 3,000 cases and as many as 5,000 cases right now. You've already seen three deaths in this country from measles, which are the total number of deaths we've had in the last 25 years, uh, is now seen in one year. We had you know, the first child death from measles in this country since 2003, and now we've had two children die, and there may well be a third child who di- who's dies. Looking at the current hospitalization rate, the current doubling rate, I think this isn't the end of it. So three people have died, two of them are children, and you write, this is not a good look for anti-vaccine activists. Let's go over the ways they're trying to distance themselves from the deaths. So uh, the first is they're saying the first death was medical malpractice. Can you explain that? Right. So what's happened is that these groups like Informed Consent Action Action Network or Children's Health Events, which are anti-vaccine groups, have sort of formed a crisis team. So when a child dies of measles, they sort of send their folks in there. In the case of malpractice, they send in a physician named Dr. Pierre Corey, who presumably read the medical record and decided that this child didn't die of measles, is what he said. The child died of mycoplasma pneumonia, pneumonia which is, you know, a generally uh, benign pneumonia. It's often referred to as walking pneumonia. But he offered then this 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 notion that because they started this this child on vancomycin and, and a third generation cephalosporin, which is typically what you would, would give for a secondary bacterial pneumonia on top of a measles pneumonia, because those secondary bacterial pneumonias are caused by staph aureus or group A beta hemolytic strep or pneumococcus. So that would be a good starting uh, 
uh, a, a way to give antibiotics, those two antibiotics. But he said because you didn't give a macrolide antibody, which, antibiotic, which would have treated the mycoplasma, but this was medical malpractice. Now, in fact, it, when challenged, he was challenged with that question and, and asked, but mycoplasma is usually fairly benign, don't you think? And, and so then he changed his mind. He said, well, you're right. Uh, he thinks that this, this virus, or this, the, the virus, uh, the measles virus was weaponized by someone in a, in a bioweapons lab to be particularly virulent. So he sort of changed his story. That's ridiculous that it was weaponized. There's zero evidence. And anyway, from someone who's been modifying viruses for over 40 years, nobody knows how to make a virus more virulent. It, these these people think you can just snap your fingers in a lab and make viruses more virulent. Oh my God, nothing could be farther from the truth. And it's virulent enough. It yeah. is quite virulent, yes. So the, um, and by the way, there's nothing you can do about the measles pneumonia, right? You have to treat the bacterial pneumonia. Right, no, it's all supportive care. That's the problem with measles. Whether you're hospitalized yeah. with measles pneumonia or measles dehydration or measles encephalitis, it's all supportive care. There's not a specific medicine you give that makes it better. All right. Then the second measles death, they claim, wasn't caused by measles. And Malone says he says he got the medical records, which sounds sketchy to me. And nobody can just go and get medical records, right? The parent would have to um, allow for that. So who knows? I mean, so he's, he's tried to say, and he's a brilliant man, Robert Malone. I mean, he did important work on mRNA technology in the late 1980s. That's my dog, by the way, walking in the back. <laughs> oh, it's appropriate for today. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he argued that, um, you know, it, it, was, it was something else. It was tonsillitis. It was infectious mononucleosis that was associated with this death. And that, that essentially that the, uh, the New York Times, which had reported it as a measles death, had lied. But in fact, the doctors immediately stood up and said, no, this was measles pulmonary failure, presumably from measles pneumonia. So again, it was a measles death. So they're trying to distance themselves from this by saying, not us, this isn't measles. Um, as a, way, a strategy, knowing that having children die because they've been so successful at scaring people away from vaccines is not a good look for them. I don't know. I don't know wh why he's gone off the deep end, Malone. You know, maybe he's mad that he didn't get enough credit for the mRNA vaccines. But this is really totally anti-scientific, right? Right. And it's that. I mean, he really did do important work on mRNA technology, both uh, in, in, uh, in cells as well as in uh, laboratory animals then, to make the point that mRNA itself could be used as a drug or used as a vaccine. That was an important observation. And it's a shame. It was published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And now he's kind of distanced himself from um, science at some level. So what, what was actually the, what would they write on the death certificate for this second? Would it be measles, or bacterial something secondary to measles? I think for that second case, it was measles pulmonary failure. Measles pulmonary failure, okay. All right, then uh, the, other, the other thing they say, and RFK said this on the very first time he talked about it at a cabinet meeting, measles is no big deal. Incidentally, there have been four measles outbreaks this year in this country last year, there were 16. So it's not unusual. We have measles outbreaks every year. Uh, many countries have measles. And RFK actually said we should be proud of just three deaths, which seems to me incredibly perverse, right? Um, I, would, I would compare it to what's happening in Europe now. We've had 640 cases here. It had 127,000 cases and 37 deaths. And so what we're doing right here in the United States is a model for the rest of the world. That was the most upsetting thing, actually, I think that RFK Jr. said regarding this outbreak. He said that if you compare us to the, he said, European region of the World Health Organization, but by which he meant Eastern European region, that they had 127,000 deaths last year and that they had, I'm sorry, that they had 127,000 cases last year and that they had uh, 36 deaths. And when you compare us to them, you know, we're like the envy of the world. But, you know, Romania has always had a couple thousand deaths a year from measles and Kazakhstan. So don't compare yourself to those countries. Compare yourselves to, to France or Germany, where we haven't done well at all. So I thought that was not only 
disingenuous, but what it, it's saying is it's saying it's okay that those children died because we're doing better. It's okay that those two healthy, young, six and eight year old children who were perfectly well nourished died of a completely preventable illness that is tragic, but it's it's being portrayed as something that not to be embarrassed about, but something to be proud of was, I thought, the most disingenuous thing he said to date on this subject. In fact, we haven't had measles deaths three measles deaths for many years, right? So we've gone downhill. Right, that the three total deaths we've had this year equals the total number of measles deaths over the last 25 years. And this is the first child to die of measles in this country since 2003, more than 20 years ago. So we're doing much, much worse. And the fact is we eliminated measles from the country by the year 2000. We showed we could do that. We showed with two doses of a vaccine and enforcing school vaccine mandates, we could eliminate measles from this country, a tremendous ex accomplishment for the most contagious of the human pathogens or human viruses. And um, and now we've stepped backwards. And that should be what, what is said here, is that this is embarrassing how we've taken, we have these deaths that are completely preventable. I mean, every child death is, is a tragedy, but when it's preventable, it's all the more tragic. You know, I, I can't recall any public health official before RFK minimizing any infectious disease. I mean, every case, every outbreak is always a reason for concern, and the officials have always portrayed it that way up till now, RFK. I just don't get it. So what he should be doing is he should be holding a press conference every other day saying, look, this is, is a preventable illness. We need to vaccinate our children. The CDC, what the CDC needs to do is they need to find out where these susceptible regions are and, and send clinics into those regions to make sure those children get vaccinated because this virus can potentially kill children and it's preventable. He should be saying that loudly and clearly and unabashedly and full-throatedly, and he doesn't at all. It's very serious, and the fact that he doesn't do it because he has certain beliefs is, uh, well, we don't care about what he believes. We know what the science is, so he should be doing this. Otherwise, he should be fired and replaced with someone who does. But that's not likely to happen in this administration, of course. Okay, and then the last point is they have said measles vaccine immunity fades. So how do you counter that? It doesn't. I mean, he's trying to, he keeps trying to make an argument for the disease. And twice, once he said that um, natural infection with measles protects you against measles for the rest of your life, which is true. But then he goes on to say that, that uh, vaccination, immunity fades 4.7% every year. The vaccines weigh in about 4.8% per year. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that it's a leaky vaccine and that problem is always going to be around. Uh, he makes these things up. I mean, obviously, if with all you need is immunological memory cells, with with two doses of vaccine, you will have a high frequency of memory cells, which will protect you for the rest of your life. And the evidence for that is that we've eliminated measles from this country. If what he's arguing that immun immunity fades 4.7 percent every year, then most adults should be highly susceptible to a disease that walks into this country all the time. I mean, international travel is common. Although we eliminated measles in 2000, we didn't eliminate people coming into this country with measles. And if all these adults were susceptible, we would have never eliminated. So that's just wrong. He also makes the case that, that natural measles infection protects against cancer, protects against autoimmune disease. Um, and that's just also completely made up. He has some level embraced measles, I think, which is just frightening. He's the Secretary of Health and Human Services in this country. Yeah, I don't think you can believe a word of what comes out of his mouth, except when he tells you his name. That's about it. But he's just full of misinformation and, and lies. You know, he says this 4.7 percent. And people think, oh, this guy has a number. He must be right without checking it. Right. He counts on the fact that no one will check on it. It sounds right. Makes sense. Sure. Why, why wouldn't immunity fade? And it's just a complete, utter lie. But, Paul, the, you know, the Senate checked him and they still confirmed him. So it doesn't seem to matter. That was a political decision. It was. Now. Can you explain the dog that caught the car? <laughs> right. So it's an old expression. I don't know. Maybe it says I'm old. But so <laughs> dogs chase cars. But then sometimes if they actually catch the car and they sort of nip at its tires, then they'll get caught under the tires. And I think the point I'm making here is that it's not the dog that's getting caught. It's the children that are getting caught under the tires at this point. So the anti-vaxxers are clearly better organized 
than pro-vaxxers, right? If you search Google for vaccine, you, all the first hits are all anti-vax hits. This has to be changed in some way. Somebody needs, or some organization, I know there are many good websites like the one at CHOP on uh, vaccines, but it's not good enough because people think that we're all in a conspiracy and we're all being paid off to say this. Is there any way that we can be more dominant than the anti-vaxxers? Well, they're well-funded. I mean, the misinformation and disinformation business is big business. It's expected, just the online part of that, is expected to make about a billion dollars a year. Mm. They clearly have support from the alternative medicine industry, and that's a big industry in this country. Um, you know, I think the information business is much, much less well-funded, and we're just not as good at getting information out there. But I think what we do need to do is we need to get those stories out there. Um, I think while it's important to counter misinformation with the right information, I do think the thing that works in our benefit in a way is the fact that children really are suffering these diseases. Not, not only measles, we had 216 influenza deaths last year, which is, hasn't been seen since the 2009 uh, swine flu pandemic. We've had a massive pertussis uh, epidemic this year with many states experiencing pertussis deaths that hadn't experienced pertussis deaths in years. I mean, I think we need to find a way to dramatize that. A choice not to get a vaccine is not a risk-free choice. It's a choice to take a different risk, and this is what that risk looks like. And there should be pictures and videos yeah. of parents talking about how they have suffered this tragedy. Uh, you probably know that Michael Osterholm and Sidrap have organized a panel of pro-vaccine experts, right, to weigh on these issues, and they have a modest amount of funding, right? And, of course, they were immediately mocked by the administration. And so that's what we're up against, people. Oh, you're just a bunch of experts repeating the old stuff over and over again. They're all conflicted. They Conspiracy, blah, blah, blah. That's it's hard to counter at this point because the anti-vaxxers are so big. But we can't give up. We can't give up. Absolutely true. You can. Uh, we'll put a link to the original column in the show notes so you can read the details and look at the links as well. That's beyond the noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.